Fukushima NRC document submits 0.5% leak release rate per day as normal operations. Plume models that would have and should have triggered PAGs but were skewed, what I call the plume model fatal flaw, for numerous reasons. One of those reasons is that the release rate was modeled at the design leakage rate of 0.5% per day. All reactors leak all the time. Another was to delay the computer capture of the Radonoclidias for 24 hours, to do computer simulations when the info garnered from them are what huge decisions are based on to prevent unnecessary uptake of ionizing radiation emitting isotopes is downright criminal. No decisions would have been made ever. To wait for actual radiation readings from those on the ground is too late to get the ball rolling to protect the public. Same old lies. Simple, easy, cheap, safe, green, clean energy they say that the new generation reactors are green and clean. They promise that nothing bad will ever happen. They promise that no radiation will ever be released. Have you heard these promises before anywhere? HMMMM, these promises seem to have a familiar ring to them. The same thing was promised about open-air nuclear bomb testing, which ended up causing a huge increase in the cancer rate globally, and millions of deaths. One of the most fundamental problems with all of these promises and assurances is that whole nuclear industry was built on secrecy and lies from the very beginning, and this secrecy continues up to today. The whole industry cannot be and will not be transparent or truthful by its very nature. Here's a conference call. The participants discussed and agreed on plausible realistic models cases for Tokyo for NARAC to run. Once agreed upon by their interagency group, this will provide to the Japanese government. The attendees agreed that the source term would include no spent fuel pool fires. So we knew we were conservative, that's the basis. They also managed to get the containment leak rates by design features of the units. So I think we're way beyond the design leakage. Design leakage? Saturday we stopped reporting on Oyster Creek. And we have models for both of the two, for Unit 2 and Unit 1 and Unit 3, I believe. So when Unit 2 came along, I think we were just been kind of averaging it out. Okay, great. So my question was, I think originally that the source term was developed based on Oyster Creek design. Is that correct? Male participant. No, we shifted away from that during the day on Saturday. Matt Kowser. Okay, great. And that was a question I had just got asked, and I thought that was probably happened at some point, but I didn't know. Johanna Turk. I have a question for the NRC. This is Johanna Turk from the NIT. There's a number floating around here, a quote that the release rate is 0.5% of the fuel per day. And I was wondering if you could confirm that for me. Male participant. No, no, that was the original assumption, and we had the containments were intact, and... That's the design leak rate for the containment. Johanna Turk. Oh, well, okay. Male participant. And that would be adjusted if we did have an actual release rate that we could come up with. Either calculated or assumed from any measurement. And so that is design leak rate for the containment. When they were assumed to be intact. So for unit 2, I guess that wouldn't apply anymore. Steve, so basically they're working on the revised dose plot using radiological data for each of the reactors at 40% core, 0.5% per day over two days. So that's in process. CM home team, we've got it guys. They're building the pallets. All the personnel have departed home to get their baggage. On the way back, we got Nellis. He's been helping us here with the palleting. have a 0.5% release rate it's only 5% release rate per day right of course so 0.5 I guess 40% that's a question to the NRC I think you guys used a 0.5% per day right that's what it shows here he's probably ran it off to do the math yes yeah, so we're looking at the assumptions here I've read that and I 
find it. It says 0.54% per day. And I have a 0.5% release rate and it's only 5% release rate per day. Right, of course. So 0.5% I guess is 40%. That's a question to the NRC. I think you guys use the 0.5% per day, right? That's what it shows here. We're looking at some different assumptions here and uh, yeah. John Nastrum. Okay, so the emission, the release rate and curious per second may be the same, but you'll have different release duration. Bruce Watson. Yeah, over the release rate. It's going to be the design rate, which we said was, I think, 0.5% of the containment per day. Right. Terry. Hey, John, this is Terry over here. Can you share that source term with us? Okay, design leak rate would be a good number to know. John? Well, design leak rate in the core melt, obviously. So, yes, so as for as the NRC stuff goes, are you guys going to do a separate analysis for units 1, 2, and 3 with different release times? Bruce Watson? What we're going to do is we're going to use the same release rate as at the doing before, and we're trying to differentiate the different times when the core went to its melt. You know, melting? So the source terms may be slightly different based on the time factor. John Nastrum, sure. And again, that may or may not be. Maybe that's more like a 10% core melt release rate. I don't know. It's a scale to measurements. So, but it's going to give us something to hang our hat on for sure now. Male participant, do you plan to compare it to the half percent release per day? John Nastro, I didn't really analyze it, you know, for that, but we can look at this. Male participant, how it compares to the design leak rate would be a good number to know. John Nastro, yes, well, design leak rate and the core melt, obviously. So, yes, so as far as the NRC stuff goes, are you guys going to do a separate analysis? 40% melt case, that? Male participant. NRC should be online too. Rick Meower. Okay, the NRC is on. It would be in a much better position to give us this update. Bruce Watson. Yeah, that's what we're doing for all the three units. Looking at 40% core melt situation for all the design leak rates. Release rate at this time. John Nastrum. Okay, now one quick comment on this is I think you guys are aware it would be useful to have like the highest probability highest dose contributing nucleides I think we had like Jeff said a 15 they were right part of our assumptions are they're going to continue to have releases right and we're hoping we would get some time and some actual data that we could say that the source term is from the venting but we don't know that what we're going to get that male participant right Part of our charter is to help generate protective guidelines for folks that are closely approaching these nuclear reactors. So in order to do that, we're going to have to make some assumptions regarding something greater than the design leak rate. You know, 40% core melt and more reactors, so... Bruce Watson, we decided that we had all those what-if projections we had made Friday and Saturday. We can always go back and use them as a reference. What we're trying to focus on now is what's really happening. And then our real concern is that sometime today or tonight, the winds are going to shift too. If this front comes through, instead of shifting at, the winds are supposed to switch around to come from the north, and even possibly from the northeast, which would then push this potential release patch over the land areas toward Tokyo. And then if we get any data that would substantiate any different release rate then we'd look at that data such so preliminary that we're doing we're doing a run we're modeling each individual reactor and then we'll have to do some kind of summation if we ever have all three of them to go at one time okay we suspect that well, we have to do some core damage in a variable degree at each one of these units we just don't know what it is right now we just try to come up with more data out of them and we'll be you know We'll be adjusting things. Our intent is to do the three models and then send them to you.
make a source term. Is that correct? I can tell you that we're going to be doing here. This is Bruce Watson with the NRC. We're basically modeling units one, two, and three for a TMI type core melt situation, which would be a 40% of the core. Because we have variable reports on foreign indiscernible possible recovery, water back in. Right now we're going to model them with design leak rates for the container basically being intact, which is about a half a percent per day leakage. And then if we can get any data that would substantiate a different release rate, then we'll look. Randy Sullivan? Yes, but you know since we don't know nothing, you know. Except that reading and the distance actually we don't even know the distance. But anyway, you know. Narak's pretty sophisticated and we thought, well heck, they're venting at 90 pounds and probably knocking it down to well below the design limit of 45. So let's just speculate. They're going from 90 to 30 or something, you know. That sounds, and from the monitor readings, you know, the monitors around the site, they kind of bump up for an hour, an hour, and 20 at a time. So I mean, you know, just connecting the knee to the bone, to the leg, to the bone, we're thinking, you know, it sounds like they're venting. And that's what Narak said. You should probably take a look at this. They're even detecting noble metals around the site, which are indicative of fuel melting. I'd ask Dan and Powers to have a five minute look at these if you could, Richard, Charlie, Sut. Got some different radioactive unique isotopes here. The LARU ratio where there has been air ingress. If not, I think the ratio should be about what is irritated fuel in general. If so, I expect RU to be high as R-U-O-X is quite volatile. I also don't like the 0 0.355 MPA pressure reading on Unit 1 yesterday that we talked about and it can't be much water going in if the fire pump pushes. It might stop pressurizing because the core uncovered so there's no more steam or leak rated containment has matched steam production at pressure. Containments usually leak at 0.5% per day at pressure. These are some questions. None of them good. Thanks, Mitchell. Results of the nucleide analysis. Joanna Turk. I have a question for the NRC. This is Joanna Turk from the NIT. There's a number flowing around here. A quote that release rate is 0.5% of the fuel per day. And I was wondering if you could confirm that for me. Male participant. No, that was the original assumption we had with the containments were intact. That's design leak rate for the containment. Joanna Turk. Okay. Male participant. And that would be adjusted if we had an actual release rate that we could come up with. Either calculate or assume from any measurement. And so that is a design leak rate for the containment when they are assumed to be intact. The permanent term reentry protective actions recommendations. It is important to identify and evaluate specific radionuclides present in the environment as well as their respective half-lives in order to accurately project doses. These guidelines recommend relocation of doses from all pathways are projected to exceed 2 rem for the year of 0.5 rem for any year thereafter, not to exceed a total dose of 5 rem over 50 years. Stand by. The release is in progress. The release is in progress. I think it's going to be a big deal because that's been creeping now to this country. It looks like 10 to 13 microcuries per milliliter airborne. It's a matter of putting it in perspective so people will know. The issue on the protective measure team is responding on a discrepancy on the source term that is used by NRC. It has to do with the releases in the modeling. The Rascal modeling for Unit 3 was substantially below the release for Units 1 and 2. And when we looked into the modeling, it's because for Unit 3 they get credit to essentially 24 hours of holdup after the fuel melt before the release started. And that's what we're doing now is going back through and verifying the sequence to make sure that these are consistent with the best information from the reactor safety team on the sequence of events at each of the three reactors. Nobody remembers what sequence things blew up. I don't. You know so, so whether in this time, 
and the fact that it was 24 hours later before Unit 3 exploded. We actually have a little graph hanging up over in the corner, which actually correlates the releases of the times of each of the events. As you can see, on every single one. But I thought the spikes for Unit 3 explosion was the highest. Male participant, I'd have to go back and look at the graph. Remember? Because I thought I just threw away. Yes, I couldn't figure out what Ariba standing in a hundred pages of I don't know promo or something like that. What we've actually released is smaller. So in fact, we now have some degrees of confidence that people have settled around and talking with the folks that what we did with the mom was basically correct. We now have the story for why up there everything else was such a low fraction. It just has a 24 hour played out, the actual. Was Unit 3 the last containment to blow up? Well, the assumption that built into that is that we had the problem in the calling of Unit 3. And you didn't have a release for 24 hours because that's the hydrogen explosion. Now it turned out Jason Chaparro has given Lou background research done by Dana Powers and a bunch of others on natural phenomena playing out. You get an enormous amount of play out. Expect the noble gas leak and you can hold it inside of that containment. So when you finally release it, the numbers for iodine and cesium are a lot lower though it could be seeking because a bunch of that has had a chance to play out. Carry the root. Maybe I can give you the soft terms. Patricia, okay. Carry. I'm showing in noble gas this is a 210 plus a 17 becquerel. Patricia? Okay. In stadium it's 9 pounds. 710 to 14. Carry Nauru. It's iodine. 810 to 15. Carry Nauru. And for helium it's 2.710 to 15 becquerel. Carry Nauru. Okay, we've evaluated the total. Patricia, yes. Carry to approximately one thousandth of the core inventory. Patricia Milligan. Okay, carry Nauru. So we tabulated for the reactor two. Patricia, yes. Carry Nauru with a hole in the containment. Yes. Chris Smith. Based on the outcome of the most recent deputies committee. We understand that the miles that are being done are not being released to anybody outside the deputies committee. Stacy Rosenberg, right. Chris Smith, however, there have been a couple questions and some of the assumptions apparent to the source term you guys provided. Stacy, questions by whom? Well, they came from our representatives that went to the indiscernible. Steve Levy, I was going to suggest, you know, as much as this, even if the hole was there, okay, that once the containment goes atmospheric, the release is going to stop. Gail, all right, Steve Levy, the containment undoubtedly went atmospheric after about a day. So what I'm going to suggest to you is to take the unit three because the power levels are consistent, and just multiply by two because the unit three were already giving it to you for a hundred percent. Gale, so you're suggesting we just drop the three unit two source you provided and use twice unit three? Right, 48 hours is problematic. Who was it? Somebody else saw a similar problem in 48 hour runs. The puff model is what's giving us the problem, but it seems somehow related to the release rate. So if you have a less of a release rate, the problem of the model can, the transport model can get all the way to 48 hours. With the high release rates, it kicks out. I've talked to the developer of that code, and he's supposed to looking into it, but I haven't seen anything back. Kimberly, okay. George AC, what's the kind of the workaround as well? There's two kind of workarounds. If all you really care about is getting the source term file so you can export it, then just don't run the close. Bill Fro, yes. Rick Maurer. Okay, 
They said the Trans-Pacific arrival time information hasn't been released yet. Still need to go through approval. Rick Mirar. But the combined source term, NERAC wanted what they were looking for. We can release that. Bill Fro. Okay, so you going to do that? Rick. Call NERAC and have them give them access to it. Bill Fro. Okay, so you're going to call NERAC and then they're going to give NRC the access. Coming out from Unit 3, but because we invariably put it in a delay in the input, what the effect of that in the running in the code is that it picked up the release after most of it was gone. Miss Eswell, yes. Miss Dorman, and in fact, missed most of the Unit 3 release in the plume. <laughs> so they made a plume model, and they missed most of the release in their plume model. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Dorman, okay. As well, that's my understanding, but again, you know, we haven't done all the troubleshooting on what occurred. Male participant. So, in Unit 1 was 70%, Unit 2 and 33, so this would only be a fraction of the total that we were modeling, right? Miss As well. Yes, but just if you want more information from Cindy Jones told me was that there was an error on the input that was essentially making the release delayed by 24 hours. They really wasn't supposed to be modeled. Dear colleagues, thank you for your recent inquiry in the Fukushima event simulation. It attaches our preliminary analysis using PC TRAN boiling water reactors as well as related software for spent fuel pool accident and atmospheric dispersion. Since the event is still ongoing and more details will be disclosed later on, you are welcome to contact us to discuss your observation and comment. This unfortunate event will change the outcome of future nuclear power development worldwide. General Emergency Field survey results indicate closed window dose rates, 1000 millirem hour expected to continue for one hour at or above the site boundary. Or analysis of field survey samples indicate thyroid, 5000 millirem for one hour of inhalation at or beyond the site boundary. The emergency director should not wait until the apical time has elapsed. We should declare the event as soon as it's determined the condition will likely exceed the apical time. The AL addresses radioactivity releases that result in doses that are above the site boundary. XC the EPA Protective Action Guides, the PAGs. Public protective actions will be necessary. Releases of this magnitude are associated with the failure of the plant systems needed for the protection of the public and likely involve fuel damage. While these failures are addressed by the other EALs, this EAL provides appropriate diversity and addresses events which may not be able to be classified on the basis of plant status alone. It is important to note that for the more severe accidents, the release may be unmonitored, or there may be large uncertainties associated with the source term. The AL addresses radioactivity releases to result in doses that are above the site boundary that exceed 10% of the EPA protective action guides. Releases of these magnitudes are associated with the failure of the plant systems needed for the protection of the public. The selected threshold value for the plant event radiation monitors represents the geometric means between calculated UA threshold. This is due to the differences in the assumptions used to determine base alarm set points and the dose assessment methodology used to calculate the release paths. Got a source term question. I received a call this morning at 0600 from Lou Brandon from the NRC Operations Center. He asked whether 
He was responsible to have a reduction in environmental release from 22% to 1% by delaying the start of drywall leakage by 23 hours. They have done multiple rascal runs since the Fukushima accident started. They provided source terms for these runs to the White House. A White House advisor asked him about the reduction from 22% to 1%. The environmental releases of cesium is 22%. Leaking from dry well to environment is at 100% per day. The dry well leakage starts at the same time as core damage starts. The dry well leakage starts 23 hours after core damage starts. A release that starts a day or more of the onset of the core damage or 10 hours or more after vessel breach would be expected to have small releases. The release fractures are noble gases, iodine, cesium. This one seems to be a lot more limited. I'm only seeing three nuclei that are contributing to the vast majority of the total Curie releases. New branding. It's because in the spin fuel pool, well maybe not totally, but you got one fresh batch, which is a third of the core, and then everything else has decayed for at least a year and a half, so. Okay, so one of them was the same error that I called you about the other day. Error number 13. A fatal error. The problem description was type mismatch. The module was mode case file, and the procedure was calc. To resolve that, a few days ago, we just ended up reinstalling Rascal. George AC? Yes, see, when I worked on it, I think that's one I worked on with maybe Rich after I talked to you or somebody. George, all we did was reboot the computer. I'm going to connect to him right now. Here he is. George AC, hello. Kimberly. Oh, George, hi. There you are. It's Kimberly. I hear you. Kimberly. I was, it's just that just left. They conveyed to me two errors. George, okay. Kimberly, rascal fatal errors. And I just need to let you know of them before it got lost somewhere. George, yes. Kimberly, if it's a good time to do that, how are we going to manage it? That's pretty much where we are. Steve Holman, question on this. This is the Steve Holman. NARAC question to the source they used to. Correlate the data, Reagan. Do you remember how much activity do they assume in the long-lived noble gas puff? Activity-wise to match the data? Bruce Watson? We didn't do any real calculations. Our modeling goes out to 50 miles. Okay. Lou Brandon? That makes sense. So we're going to try and model this with one big reactor instead of two little ones because Rascal doesn't really have that option of choose two or get a double output because they never designed multiple reactors melting down at the same time so it's not even in their output <laughs> but the fact is if you released all the fission products in two little ones it might be a greater impact than the Grand Gulf is going to provide to you it's probably why it will probably overestimate anyway so maybe fine to answer that question what we're looking at right now is these NOAA runs I don't know Steve, I dropped all the beta emitters, Kathy Brock. I mean, really, there's the civilians, iodines, you know, there's the biggies in there, Steve. That's exactly why we give you cesium, barium-140, lanthanium-140, tellurium-132, because it's the precursor to iodine and xenon. Therefore, we're assuming an elevated release, a ground-level release. Brenda, okay. Steve? I think that's really all, okay? We'll put a list of the nuclides on it. Okay. On your print. Brenda? Okay. Steve? 12, 13, 14. We down to 18. I dropped all the beta emitters. Okay.